Welcome everybody to the Utah Story Show. Today on the program, Planning Director Nick Norris is joining us to talk about the future growth and development of downtown Salt Lake City. So if you've lived in Salt Lake City for a while, you might notice that things are changing very, very quickly. Buildings are rising everywhere and it is becoming far more residential than it has ever been before. But the problem is our air quality sucks and a lot of people want to still drive their cars. So we're stuck between a rock and a hard place because we have to accommodate the growth. We have to become more dense, but we have to get more people out of cars. I think that's one of the biggest challenges. And another one of the big challenges is how do we preserve the historic character of downtown Salt Lake City, especially Main Street? If you've followed Utah stories for a while, we like to focus on the historic charm and the character of Main Street and the local businesses that are in the downtown area. How do you accommodate all of their needs and how do you accommodate the needs of the, cro of the growing number of people infusing cash and development dollars into downtown Salt Lake, growing our metropolitan area at an enormous pace. Nick Norris, thanks for joining me. Of course, happy to be here. So you came in today on an electric bike from I downtown did. Salt Lake City. How treacherous is that to do that? Um, you know, there's certainly some parts that are rough, but I think I think the good things about it is that there's some starting to be a much better network. Yeah. So it's pretty easy to get, for example, from downtown to the S line on, you know, two or three hundred um, east. Mm -hmm. You know, and then just S line all the way up here, and then down. You know, relatively quiet i mean a big road but a relatively quiet street to get here so yeah that that s line trail is my favorite biking trail by far it's yeah. just wide you never feel like you're gonna hit somebody and it's you know a corridor with the s line train but i think the trail is actually even better than the train and is, right. was that all by design yeah i think it was i think i think um connecting places particularly to Sugar House, because it is such a growing business district. I mean, it's always been a business district, but it's becoming more of a destination for people. And being able to connect, you know, people who live in South Salt Lake, people who live east, even, you know, into Mill Creek with the Parley's Trail, um, is, is, it's a perfect example of what happens when you can create safe uh, bicycle and, and pedestrian infrastructure for people. Yeah, and it seems like... Um as far as biking goes, it's really great until you get past, I would say, about 2,700 south. It's gotten a lot better. And I live out in Murray now. I had to move from, from oh. Sugar House to Murray. And it's like they have these bike lanes, and they'll go for a couple blocks, and then they just stop. Like, you should just stop riding your bike. <laughs> and it's and it's kind of frustrating and annoying is it is it like a, a kind of an uphill battle to get this message out to the suburban communities uh boy i i think it's a hard battle for sure um i think more and more people are interested in um particularly riding bikes mm -hmm. um even just for fun right yeah and it's so, just man i got like i was telling you before we got a cargo bike i had electrified i could put my two kids on the back i could take them to school and it we can go like 20 miles an hour on the side roads it's just so awesome and it's such a more economical fun way to go around is so that's got to be part of your your messaging yeah, and your goal yeah i too. think so it's not you know i think for a long time um cities have looked at bicycle network as just for commuters right mm -hmm. but the one thing about being a truly livable city is that you need it for other things too you need to be able to if you if you choose to be able to ride to the store yeah you know and that's one of the big barriers um, and to ride, you know, drop your kids off at school or daycare, or ride with them to those places, uh, which has kind of been a, a lost art in the in the age of the automobile. Um, you know, very few people are actually walking their kids to school these days. Even in Salt Lake City, there's less and less. And so, um, all of that infrastructure, whether it's bike lanes, whether they're you know even just painted on, is good. There's way better ways to do it and make it yeah. safer, particularly for those people who are uncomfortable. Then there's a lot of people who are uncomfortable being riding a bike on a street with cars. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so anything that we can do to improve that is going to have benefits that are go above and beyond just commuting. Yeah. One thing I was really surprised to see was the third West corridor, how you guys put this big wide sidewalk in trees. And is that, 
to just get more people on the bikes and get them commuting? Yeah, partly. It's also, um, you know, the 300 West Corridor is going to go through a major land use transformation. We know that, right? We're already starting to see it. Um, you know, what was once a pretty heavy commercial and light industrial type of corridor and then a big box corridor. Now we're starting to see people live there mm -hmm. um, and people use it for other means than that. And so um, the, the great thing about the 300 West Corridor and wh what we've done so far and what we hope to continue is that it adds that element and transforms a core, an auto oriented corridor and starts to do that. And it can be a model, not just for other places in Salt Lake city, but other places in the region. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's still some challenges with it. It, it doesn't connect all the way into downtown yet. Right. Um, you know, and once it becomes more of a UDOT road, that becomes a lot more of a, of a difficult task, uh, to tackle. Oh, and, is that what you're up against? You dot well, some of it, yeah. You know, even when we get closer to, you know, 2100 South, where it just kind of ends, you know, we've got, you, you start to have, have to work with UDOT, um, and our transportation division usually leads out on that. Um, and so it's just one of those, another, um, you know, barrier to try to get through to get that, to get that done. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, it just seems like the, the 900 South region where the uh i i think maybe you you partnered with the jordan river commission to do that project where the jordan river trail spills off into the 900 south corridor that goes yeah. right into the city that was a really cool move as well did was was, yeah. was that a coordinated effort how did you get uh you know that's actually been in the city's plan since the 80s um that trail and mm -hmm. and connecting the the river actually up to the shoreline trail um and then it was a student project maybe from the university maybe 10 ish plus years ago now um where they branded it as the nine line um and i think it was always viewed as a recreational type of trail and the one thing that and that makes sense along like the where it interacts with the with the parkway because the parkway mostly is that um but now we're starting to see that it can you know we did a the nine line uh, plan you know in the Boy, what, what year was that? 2014, 2015, oh, really? um, something like that, um, which envisioned that that trail being much more than just a recreational trail, mm -hmm. that it could be for transportation, that it could link people and bring people to, you know, the Central Ninth neighborhood, um, all, even up to the um, Ninth and Ninth, up to the zoo. Yeah. Uh, and then even west, right, you know, connecting those neighborhoods and, and helping to bridge that gap that's been created by and that barrier that's been created by I-15 and the railroads. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's one of the few places where you can actually cross. And so um, that trail is so important to the c connectivity of the entire city. Yeah. So it, it's a great feather. The other one that's coming along that's similar is the Folsom Corridor, um, which is, you know, runs on, along the old um, – abandoned rail line and through the um, Euclid neighborhood. So it connects the parkway to downtown um, and starts to be a second access point. What What are the coordinates of that? So that that runs uh, just behind, you know, the gateway development. Um, it follows the rail line and then oh, okay. goes out west underneath. North, north, south? Yeah, it goes underneath I-15, same spot where the rail does. Hmm. Um, and, you know, the rail consolidated several years you know, about a decade ago, maybe longer than that now, um, onto uh, South Temple, and it freed up the the second rail that used to be there. And so we're converting that. We're, we're building that Folsom Trail along there. Cool. Yeah. I, I didn't know about that one. Um, as far as, like, bigger picture stuff goes, uh, you've had the really difficult challenge of just accommodating this population explosion in downtown Salt Lake and all these – people want to live downtown. I, I mean, it's, it doesn't in, in recent history, you Salt Lake's always really been a commuter city. Like the population doubles or triples when people go to work. Is this been, um, is this, is this driven by developers or is it driven more by people who really want to live, work and play downtown? Well, I think it's driven by a couple of things. Um, one, it's the demand, right? Um, but two, the, the city has long envisioned more people living downtown, and we put policies in place to achieve that, but the market wasn't there, right? Either there just wasn't the demand, there wasn't the development interest to, to do it, 
Um, now in the last, particularly in the last three years, but it's really been about the last six or seven, um, we started to see that demand change to the point where, you know, I think, I don't know the exact numbers, but, you know, I think we've more than doubled the housing units in downtown in the last five years. And we're going to keep going on that trajectory. You know, the, the downtown plan, which we um, adopted in 2016, is a was intended to go through the year 2040 and it envisioned a downtown population of 20,000 people. And we think we're, we're probably already more than halfway there. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that's a reflection of the demand and it is a reflection of the development community responding to that. Yeah. And it seems like these development companies, they, they have a kind of a, a, a vision for how to not just build buildings, but how to make it and integrate with the rest of the community like this post place project yeah. they're um they're doing a whole lot of different things besides just housing how how is that working out to integrate with the rest of downtown well it's great when you have a developer who wants to do those things right and not ever, not all developers are um or property owners want to do that um so there's, it's a mixed bag, frankly, you know, some, you know, the, the developers of, of, you know, the post district really wanted to create a place and they had some experience doing that in other places, particularly in Denver. And so, um, you know, and, and they had a local partner who's doing some other great things in, in the area too. Um, so they, you know, they had a different lens on it than somebody who primarily just builds multifamily, mm-hmm. right? Or you know, like and, luxury. High yeah, and, they, and you know, they may not have experience in managing a mixed-use building or figuring out how to curate the ground floor use or even provide the space. And so that's kind of where a lot of our um, processes in the city, particularly in the planning divisions, step in, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we recognize that on, you know, not every building is going to be a mixed-use building, but if you want to be a walkable city and a livable city, you need mixed use district where things are close. And so you need the spaces and the challenge is trying to figure out who's going to do that and when they're going to do it. You know, um, providing it is step one. Mm-hmm. It may there may not be a market for it. Um, and so if, if you can get that ground floor space to be as flexible as possible when that market does change and there is some demand for that, then we start seeing those things fill up. Yeah, and I I think that is the biggest challenge to zone at a human scale because I'm watching the street my office was on for eight years on 3rd South Broadway, Mm -hmm. and it's undergoing a big transformation as well because that street had the best mixed use, I think, of any area in downtown. You had all these really cool boutiques, restaurants, and apartments. And now a lot of the people are just uh, realizing, you know, they're all one or two stories that, you, of course, you, it's time to go higher. But is I, I see, like, Ken Sanders is moving out. All of those places owned by uh, uh, Otto Maletti, the, the Tabernacle, and, the you know, all these little boutique shops have, have been leveled. What is it you can do to try to convince the developer yeah. to make it mi- mixed use, or is is that even possible? So we so what what we do is that we do have some um, zoning regulations that require some ground floor use um, and that require it to be built to a certain standard, so that even if it's not um, a commercial use at the moment, it can be it can transform to that as the market changes. So. Um, that's one of the big things that, you know, we recently um, moved through the Planning Commission proposal that, that we call our Downtown Building Heights and Street Activation Standards, which change, which aims at doing that downtown-wide, not just in the Central Business District, but all the way down to the Gateway and all the way south down to the Central Ninth neighborhood. So a pretty extensive proposal. Um, but that's, that's what we're aiming to try to do. We can't you know, we don't know, we can't force a specific use into a space. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's that's where the, the zoning sets the framework. It can, you can use incentives to try to get some of that those things. Uh, and we do have um, a number of incentives in that proposal to do that. You know, for example, if you want extra building height, there's, you have a menu of like four or five things that you can pick from, but you have to activate the ground floor. You know, that's that's a requirement. If you go above and beyond just that activation, actually fill the space and stuff like oh, that, okay. then you can so get so that some extra way it can height. become economical. For yeah, them. yeah, and the extra height helps support that 
you know, the economic cost of curating that for the property owner. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, speaking of height, um, you recently put out a memo that it's time to go higher with our yep. zoning. And I was surprised to see that the the building height maximum went from, I believe, 70 to 150 feet or 180 feet even. Is that right? So it's different in different zones. So in the central business district, which really is the main street corridor that generally extends from like 200 east west to, you know, West Temple, um, there's never actually been a height limit in that zone. Hmm. Um, there's triggers for certain public reviews. Um, and so we've made those consistent. But in other downtown zones, there has been a height limit. And we went from basically um, the most you could do by right in most of those zones was about 75 feet. Some of them were 60. And, um, you know, one of the things that we need as a growing city is that that land in those in the downtown area has to be more productive than just four or five or less story buildings. Yeah. And, you know, otherwise it puts all the pressure on every, every other part of the city. And so um, we looked at trying to align the permitted building heights to construction types in the building code so that it's it's a little bit more, you know, we're not um, unnecessarily restricting certain development type um, that wants to use wood construction, for example, mm -hmm. um, or in the downtown core, or actually in the gateway mixed use area down by gateway, um, even those type one, the steel and, and, you know, structured concrete construction. So we were trying to remove some of those barriers from that. There's still the, there's triggers for design, what we call design review, which is really making sure that those buildings are uh, presenting themselves well to the street, providing those spaces and not negatively impacting um, public spaces and neighbors. Um, and, you know, it's not about architectural design or anything like that. So um, we still maintain that. It just we increase those thresholds for the most part. Yeah. And there's, so there's a proposal already out there for a building. I think it's called Euclid. Is that right? Or it's supposed to be the, the tallest building in downtown Salt Lake? Oh, yeah. So uh, the name's changed, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's right on State Street and 200 South under construction. Yeah, so yeah. It'll, it'll be residential, commercial? It'll or? be mixed use. It'll be ground fl or there'll be some ground floor commercial space and then um, some ground floor space for the residential use lobbies and things like that. And then it'll be residential above that huh. all the way up. It's almost 450 feet, I think. Wow. So that'll be a giant residential tower. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and so what we've we've talked a lot about on this program is is the lack of affordable housing. There's just not nearly enough, and most of the housing that's being built is higher end, yeah. which puts downward pressure on affordability. But what is it that could be done to create more affordability? You think going taller, more more big, tall, tall high-rise housing developments would be the answer? Or so, so one of the things that we're actually working on right now is what we call their affordable housing incentives. And so if... If somebody is including affordable housing units, um, they have more development right, right? Mm -hmm. um, what do you mean by development so right? So they can either go taller, they can increase their overall oh, okay. density, um, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the reality is that, that the market by itself, the development market by itself, is not going to produce affordable housing. No. And so you have to figure out ways to do it. And, you know, in Utah, we can't use inclusionary zoning. And there's some, there's a mixed bag on the effectiveness of inclusionary zoning anyway. What is that? And mean? so, so inclusionary zoning is when you re, you require a certain number of percentage of units in a residential development to be uh, earmarked for affordable housing. Oh, so okay. maybe it's, you know, 10% of those units have to be available to people who make about 60% or you know, ideally it's 60% or less, but most of them are 80% or less uh, of the area media, median It's income. just a law saying you can't do that here. Yeah, the state uh, legislature basically said, you know, you can't do that. You can do it if it's mutually agreed upon and there's some kind of offset for it, which is the genesis of our affordable housing incentives. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that we're trying to do that, for example, if the city is investing, we have a, a bunch of money that we put towards affordable housing every year. Um, and either through our general fund or mostly through the RDA. 
um, through their tax increment. Yeah, I read collect. there's fifty million dollars set so, aside for. Yeah, it. there's a ton, and now you know finally the last years the state's starting to kick in more. They've always kicked in some, but they're they're recognizing that need and they're kicking in more. Um, but what these incentives do is that if somebody is getting that money and say say they're building a something a building that has a hundred units in it and twenty percent of those are going to be affordable because they want to use either city or federal or state dollars to do it. Um, one of the goals of these incentives is to actually further make that um, more affordable, either through more units or through a lower um, level of affordability. Mm -hmm. And we can do that because if they're, you know, if they were only going to build 100 units generally and 10 or 20 of them are affordable, the other 80 typically make up that, that loss in revenue for the building owner right and so what this does is that it lets there be more units that can capture that yeah and reduce that that loss and so um that that's a big big goal we're trying to do it citywide it's been pretty controversial so you, uh, you could give a developer like a 10 million dollar cash handout to just no. make it affordable or or to make it so the city units, or... the city does have some programs to help fill gaps in financing mm -hmm. um and you, you read about those all the time right and so what this would do is hopefully, and it's intended to do, is for those dollars to either produce more units or produce a lower level of affordability because there's more development potential associated with it. Yeah, but it's not, it's, it's not cash handouts? It's not grants? It, so not, not on our end, but mm -hmm. there, are some, um, there, are, there are some various financing tools, whether it's cash or loan programs or oh, okay. things like that, so or using just city lower land. The interest rate or yeah, lower the exactly. Loan and and a lot of a lot of affordable developments have what's called a, a financing gap, right? So it may cost them ten million dollars to do the development. They can finance eight million of that, and they need to figure out how to get the other two million. And most, you know, a lot of developers in that example wouldn't have that two million on hand, and so they try to seek out other ways to finance that. And so the city does a lot of similar loans to that. Um, and so, and that's how we primarily use our money. Yeah. That, that's your mark for affordable housing. Yeah, and, and also along those lines, it's like um, the way I, we had Samuel Granny who's building that other yeah. side village on the program. And the way he describes it is the bottom rung of the ladder has basically been wiped out. Yep. <laughs> the people living on the lowest rung of the ladder, they can't afford to live in and around Salt Lake City anymore. And there's there's no easy solution, but it seems like tiny home village could be a solution, especially a transit oriented um development maybe even like out in Magda or somewhere that where you could just move people so so the service sector employees are still able to work in downtown that's right um but what are, are you involved in that is your office helping with that? yeah we're involved on the zoning side of things with that you know right now our, our zoning is pretty restrictive for that type of development and so um one of the things that's pending in front of the city council is the zoning for that um you know that tiny home village that the other side academy is proposing oh and you're working on that so we're working on the zoning side of that uh, we don't typically get involved too much on the financing and because it's city land the public benefit analysis is required under our laws to to use um, city land for private purposes and things like that so um, but yeah those those are all all of those things are necessary for to help address um, housing issues right you know when you when you talk about homelessness one of the biggest indicators of of a growing trend in homelessness is very very low housing vacancy rates which we have had now for several years yeah and, and, rents so, going and up yeah so and quickly. when you have that it's going to drive the rents up it's going to make housing more and more unaffordable for those people on the lower end of, particularly on the lower end of the income spectrum i mean it makes it more unaffordable for a lot of people um but particularly those that have very limited income and who don't have a lot of options and yeah. so that's that's why you know historically zoning has actually been a, ver a barrier to a lot of affordable housing either yeah. it doesn't allow the housing types you know um things like when you have minimum lot sizes for example it almost forces homes to be a certain size and so those are all things that have contributed over time to that and zoning is very slow at cap at uh, catching up to those needs and so that's one of the, the main focuses that we have is trying to find ways to remove the zoning barriers for those housing types not just 
for one project, but um, in many parts of the city so that there's more options. We know that not every property is going to be re redeveloped in the city, but when you're a build-out city and all development is competing for the same land, mm -hmm. um, that low-income housing is going to be the, the land use that loses out. Yeah. And so we need to find ways to incentivize that, and that's what we're trying and to do. It, with and some it of these seems things. to me like, yeah, I mean, out in Murray, where I'm at, you you see these big lots, just like half acre lots still. And if you could incentivize or change zoning in some of those neighborhoods to allow tiny homes or a tiny home community, then they're close enough to downtown where people could commute. Um, is that, but that's involving the county and the other cities. Is this is this a Wasatch Front effort at all, or is it is it your office, or are you trying to team up with other cities to? to it look is. Into doing it this? needs to be a regional effort. You know, mm -hmm. Salt Lake City can do everything in our power to promote more affordable housing, but we are a relatively small cog in the giant housing wheel that makes up the region, and so other communities and other cities, you know, have to have to be willing to participate as well. Um, we do work with a number of um, other cities through the Utah League of Cities and Towns on housing-related issues um, that intersect with the state legislature in particularly. Um, but we want to be a model for other cities. We want to do things and show other cities that it can work and it can work and not be um, – and not have the, the same sort of fear of – being detrimental that that people think you know change is hard and mm -hmm. i think it's human nature to oppose change and, and nimbyism and, is kind of a natural reaction but i pointed out before you go to europe we have this like attachment to our cars attachment to our zoning attachment to this idea that bad density is bad but you go to europe and you see all of these mixed use zonings where we lived in the uk for a year and they'd have really small flats next to luxury big houses and then um just all this different residential variety yeah and you almost never see that here in the united states and it, so and it just seems like we have our really distinct classes depending on how neighborhoods are laid out and zoned and is that is that a big barrier to get people oh to yeah think differently oh yeah it's huge and and the real and the irony ironic thing about that is that our historic development pattern particularly in salt lake city is exactly what you described where we have a mix of housing types mm -hmm. you, know, you can go up south temple and see just incredible mansions and on this you know their neighbor is a six or seven unit apartment building right mm -hmm. i mean and so that's our historic pattern mm -hmm. and we love those places and a lot of it is because we love the architecture right but we also love that scale and how it makes us feel when we're there. And I'm a firm believer that you, we can achieve that with modern architecture too. And so, um, you know, the problem is zoning has, has been used to segregate people by income, by race, by ethnicity, ethnicity. Um, and you know, the, the landmark U S Supreme court case, Euclid versus Ambler reality or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it even said it, even the Supreme court even basically said that, you know, people who live in apartments are lesser than people who live in single family homes. And it's, it's that's in the language. That's in the lane. That's in the decision, <laughs> wow. you know? And so it's really hard to, in this day and age to sit there and read that and think that that was the right course of action when did that decision come that was in like know? the 1930s okay. 30s or 40s so long time ago yeah because i i was uh i go up to park city with my wife and i'm like okay this was a mining town this this wasn't even intended to be probably yeah. a permanent town but they put the streets they put this the buildings right up against the street They they didn't intend to have you know, perfect parking scenarios, of course, <laughs> yeah. before they had cars and, and everybody loves it and everybody wants to be there and everybody wants to just walk. You see people just walk down the street, walk up the street, walk down the street, just because oh, yeah. it feels so cool That's to right. see all these shops right against the street. Whereas our more modern suburban model is we got to have a strip mall and provide a certain amount of parking spaces for every single store. And that's mandated through zoning. Yep. So it's just like this these ugly ideas are built into our zoning and, and, and that just seems to be 
just a way to guarantee that new developments are going to be ugly. So how do you, you, you just said you think you can do it through modern architecture. How do you do it? Well, I think the big, I think the big thing is that scale, right? And we see it in Salt Lake, you know, you have some, some pretty contemporary buildings that are huge. Mm -hmm. And when you just use, you know, a, a, one of those, like there, I mean, people refer to it as stucco, but it's really a different, um, skinning system. But, um, you know, when they use that over these massive footprint buildings, there is no human scale, even if you design a great first floor. And, and so that's one of the things that we've actually struggled with because we have such huge lots and such huge blocks, you know, it's hard to force a property owner to build multiple smaller buildings, but in these places where we don't have that pattern and we have smaller lots and we can zone for scale over use, we can start to achieve that. And I think that's what we're starting to see in some places like, you know, along 900 South in Salt Lake, where we've had a number of homes kind of start convert into businesses and restaurants. You know, some of our great restaurants are on 900 South oh, yeah. and old homes. Yeah, and, lower ninth area. Yeah, yeah. and, you know, that extends, you know, starting to extend into the Central Ninth. And, you know, we've had some issues with new development in Central Ninth, but part of that downtown zoning change, building height stuff we're talking about addresses that. But... But I think we can get there. I just think we need to refocus how and why we're zoning. And if we can focus on building scale more and use less, then we can get back to our historic development patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I agree with you for sure. And I and I think it's really exciting to watch the growth of Salt Lake. I know a lot of people think our city is just crazy. In terms of what's changing, it's it's just you see way more people, way more homeless people, way more traffic congestion. And I think the, the most difficult thing seems to be just getting people out of their cars. Yeah. Um, so it's do you have a PR message to get people out of the cars <laughs> or how do you do it? Um, well, I think I think the, the best thing I mean, obviously, I have my role as planning director. Right. Mm -hmm. And. Um, in that role, the best thing we can do is to modify our zoning to create a more livable city. That's going to take decades, mm -hmm. right? That's, you know, I won't be there when that, when we start realizing that, but we can start realizing some of that now. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people and, who've never been to Europe don't even know it's possible. You know, I don't even know if you have to necessarily go to Europe for that. I think there are all kinds of places in the United States that people can visit. And a lot, of, I think there's a lot to learn from small towns. You know, because a lot of them with their main street, they have, you know, they've maintained a lot of that um, incremental style of development and scale. Um, but there's other places, too. You know, a group of, you know, we were just in Cincinnati with the Downtown Alliance, um, you know, learning from how their business community has responded to things and how they do things. And, you know, we spent a lot of time in this neighborhood called Over the Rhine, which was just a phenomenal you know, 1850s neighborhood that's maintained almost all of its traditional scale, um, even with new buildings and, oh. you know, small streets, people were everywhere out and about. Check it out. Yeah. It's, you know, and it's in a place like Cincinnati, right? Yeah, like, and I think it's, it's, you, you see it in old neighborhoods. Yeah, but exactly. I, I have yet to see new development. I mean, they do, they incorporate mixed there, use, but it's not nearly as well, cool as like Park City or even like downtown Moab, downtown Salt Lake, yeah. the, 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 downtowns that were built before and, you know the 19 probably the 1930s yeah and a lot of that is is due to a few things to like you mentioned Bob, like plowing through the state road and making it wider and the sheer amount of traffic it handles you know mm -hmm. that's hard that's hard on those uh, you know it seems great but it's a creates a lot of growing pains for places um but but the you know the one the one takeaway i had from this neighborhood in cincinnati was because there was a lot of new buildings mixed in you know, and they've maintained great scale hmm. and that and, you know, they use similar building materials. There, there were contemporary designs and takes on the old historic architecture, but they did a, a, an amazing job and have done an amazing job of having new buildings fit in. Yeah. Uh, you can tell they're new. You know, they look modern, mm -hmm. but they have a lot of the great characteristics. And so I think that's, you know, I, I think you can do it. Yeah. Well, very, very good to hear. Yeah, I, I love downtown. I love Main Street. I just, I hate seeing that so many local businesses are struggling right now because oh, yeah. not only can they not fire, hire workers because it's so expensive to live in downtown, but there's growing homeless population and 
so many issues to tackle. So it's definitely you got a challenging job, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, and some of that, you know, we can we can work on. Some of it is probably out of even the city's control, right? And you know, just the cost of operating a business right now is crazy. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. and so it, it's to me, it's amazing how innovative business owners have been, you know, and operators have been. Um, and it's very unfortunate when we lose some of these longstanding businesses who have decided, even when they just decide, you know what. It's not worth it anymore, you know, yeah. kind of a thing. You, I, well, they're not forced it. out, and and that's that's gut wrench, wrenching, you know, because those are the those are the the places that make community. Yeah. Well, it's cool what you're doing, Nick. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, glad to be here. All right, all right. Okay, and we're going to take a break. And the second part of our show, we're going to be talking to Glenn Bailey, who is the executive director of Urban Crossroads Center. It's one of the longest standing homeless outreach centers. And he's going to be talking about the, we're going to be talking about the homeless issues. How do we solve them? How do we get more affordable housing and more people off the streets? That's going to be coming up in about 10 minutes. Thanks for joining me.